So today we're starting with heap exploitation. Uh, there are a couple of links on the Moodle section below it. Uh, the slides are uploaded. Um, what's it called? A few downloadable files are there that I may like might do some demos on today if you want to download them. Hopefully they run on your devices, but with heap subs, the period they might not depend on your version. Um, if not, and you want to run them, come to Office Hours or whatever, talk, come talk to us. We can look at, look at them. Uh, and there are two links that are recommended readings on this. You don't have to do it. They're basically going to recap what we're going to talk about in the lecture, but you may want to use them anyways. We're also releasing a homework today. It's going to be just a multiple choice homework uh, due in about a week. It shouldn't take long at all. Just kind of on the heap stuff we're about to cover. Just some simple questions on that, all multiple choice or spotable type stuff. Okay, so today's content. That is not today's content, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> okay, today's content. Uh, so we're talking about the C heap, what it is, how it works, uh, how to safely use it, avoid the bugs that might happen there, Maybe about heap chunks, free lists, and like default allocation and freeing procedures. We're gonna have to see how far we get with this today. We have another lecture planned for this where we can go over to the next lecture with this. If we don't get through all of it, which I assume we probably won't, but this is the goal. Uh, so starting with the GLPC library, uh, you've all been using it in your project. This is the, basically the core library that C generally uses on Linux systems. Uh, it has many, uh, provides you with many library functions like string length, printf, malloc, free. All of these come from libc, that your program is dynamically linked again. That's where like, the GOT and PLT stuff came in, so like, dynamically resolve those function calls. Um, and the libc basically provides useful functions and general wrappers around syscalls. So even if you were to, in your code, call read or write as a, like, as, as a function call, this would not immediately call the read or write syscall. This would then go into a libc function that wraps the write syscall and so on. Just like printf is going to do a lot of formatting stuff with like its format strings and whatever, and eventually it's going to call write in the background. <clears throat> and the two we care about in this lecture now are malloc and free, basically the functions to uh, invoke heap routines. I hope you've all used them before in 230 or 198c, whichever class you took leading up to this. Um, to start with malloc, it's the glibc or the general memory allocators, generally referred to as malloc on Linux systems. Um, it's been exploited since about 20 years now. Uh, not quite as long as stack vulnerabilities, but still pretty long. Uh, it's still somewhat an active field of research with new techniques coming out. And but it's getting hard because there are also about like 30 to 35 heap mitigations at this point that have all kind of been building up over the years. We're gonna happily ignore most of these for our exploitation lectures, but it's been getting more difficult. And basically the purpose of the heap is to provide processes with dynamic memory. So you have your stack, the size of the stack is of the stack frame is going to be decided at compile time. Maybe you don't know the size of that something's gonna be until after you're at runtime. So now you're gonna need the heap to provide dynamic memory where you can instantiate it with whatever size memory you want at runtime. So some APIs that libc provides you to use the heap are malloc to just allocate some memory, free to free some memory, basically give it back to the system, realloc to take something that was previously allocated by malloc and reallocate it to a different size, and calloc to basically the same as malloc, just that the memory it gives you is also zeroed out. With malloc memory you're given is not guaranteed to be zeroed out. Okay, any questions so far? This should, for the most part, just be review, I would imagine, but. All right, moving on. <clears throat> so let's walk through a small example of, yeah, let's, let's go through a small demo at this point. Uh, first off, we're gonna introduce some new GDB commands here. You can all use them through PonyBug. I think they should also be on the GDB cheat sheet, at least a couple of those. The first one is probably the one you're gonna be using the most. This, it stands for Visualize Heap Chunks. And this basically lets you just print out what's currently on the heap. Uh, then there are a bunch of commands to print out something called bins. Uh, we'll talk about them later. Basically, there's the bins commands, which just prints out all of the bins, and then you can also just print out specific ones at once. Uh, we'll talk about what they are later. 
Uh, there is VM map. You've been using that for a while now. Basically, prints out uh, the memory mapping of the process. And there's top chunk, print out the address and size of the top chunk. We'll also talk about that later. So let's get into the demo. It's readable for everyone. OK, so the first uh, demo, so the demo we're going to be looking at is uh, so basically a small C program. We're initializing a struct called books as uh, two character strings, title, author, and then an integer for ID. Uh, should be about 36 bytes. Padded out probably 30. Uh, uh, probably going to be padded out on an 8-byte boundary, so probably more like 40 bytes, but yeah. Uh, then we initialize a static array called of struct books, where we uh, can store eight of these book structs in that array. And then we start executing the main function. So the first thing we do is we call malloc twice to fill in the first two entries in this books array. Then we're going to fill both of these in with data, just give it some titles, give it some authors, give it some IDs, and then we're going to free both of them. Very simple program. So let's open it up in GDB and start to go to the beginning. Let's do that again. Okay. So we're now at the beginning of main. Um, if we execute the map at this point, you will see that well, I should probably zoom out a little bit for this. Was, okay, this is no longer readable for you guys. Uh, but this basically says that heap is going to be yellow colored. And as you can see from the colors here, nothing here is yellow. This is because there is no heap memory region yet. Before, so so far the program has done a startup and it has called main, but the heap has not been used by the startup routine. So the heap has just not been allocated yet. Allocating the heap requires to invoke the operating system, and that is expensive. So if a program never uses the heap, we just don't allocate the heap, heap ever. So the memory map, there is no heap here, which I believe for most of the projects that you've done, there probably wasn't. Actually, I think once you call print F or puts, those are going to internally allocate heaps pretty often. Um, but yeah, so in this case, there's no heap yet. So now we're going to execute the first line of code, being the one that allocates the first book structure. And if we execute VM map again, we'll see that a heap has been allocated, this yellow region here. This is readable, writable of size 0x21000, fairly large region. Does anyone want to take a guess why this region is so large, even though we only requested about, <coughs> what, 40 bytes? Yeah. Because then the program doesn't know how many bytes we're going to need, so it doesn't want to allocate super often. But we did tell it that we want 40 bytes. But isn't it possible that you would later in the program want more? And it, it's preparing for that? Pretty much, yes. Okay. Uh, so this allocation we asked for 40 bytes. So this would only give us back 40 bytes. That's what we have to use if we try to use more than that what's happened. So we have a heap overflow in that case. But what if you try to get another 40 bytes later? Do you really want to once again call a syscall, get the OS involved, and ask the operating system, hey, I want some more heap memory, and then do that every single time you want like 20 more bytes of heap space or whatever? That's really expensive. So what's done instead is that the, when you do a heap allocation, it gives you a big chunk of memory, and then that's where it, the libc heap allocator then comes in. So the operating system, you use some syscall to give you memory, and then the libc heap allocator, it then manages this big chunk of memory and gives you small parts of it one at a time until it completely runs out, and then it asks the operating system for more memory. Does this part make sense? OK. So we now have this memory. So what if we now type the this command? So now the heap gets displayed here. This is our heap region that's currently in use. So there are a few things to note here. Uh, first of all, we asked for 36 to 40 bytes, depending on padding. But this is, I guess, I guess I'm sorry for something else, first of all. Uh, so the way this is structured is that in this first field here, there's a size field. In this case, it reads 0x31. The one is a flag. Uh, it's always going to be uh, aligned. So the lower, lowest three bits of this are always going to be flags. So the actual size here is 0x30. 0x30 is 48 bytes, but we asked for 36 or to 34 to like or 36 like 40 bytes. So why did it give us 48 bytes instead? Anyone want to take a guess? Sixty-two. Bytes. 
aligned. Yeah, exactly. Just like everything in the stack, we like alignment. Alignment makes things faster. Alignment makes things cleaner. So the heap allocator gave us 48 bytes. So this already is something that kind of tells you that heap allocations are often are generally less performant than stack allocations. First of all, you gotta invoke this heap routine, the malloc call, which is much more expensive than just like subtracting from RSP. Second of all, you don't usually get exact values. It's always gonna be rounded up, especially if you have a lot of small allocations. You're, you might be wasting a lot of space there. Okay, so we have this region here. It's 48 bytes in this case, and this is the region we just allocated. Underneath it, there's a large number, 0x20fd1. This is the top chunk pointer. This is basically, or not the top chunk size field. This basically tells us how many bytes of heap we have left. So if you remember when we executed VM map earlier, we could see that we, in total, we allocated 0x21000 bytes of heap space. <clears throat> so the top chunk, then, when we did this allocation at the beginning, the top chunk would have been here. At, then we do this allocation, and the top chunk basically goes down 0x30 uh, bytes, and then gets decremented by the 0x30. Basically, so this basically keeps track of how many bytes we have left. So if we were to do another allocation at this point, so do another exactly the same allocation to allocate the next books array, we would subtract another 0x30 from this, move this down 0x30 bytes, and then the area between this and the top, and the top chunk size field is going to be where the next allocation lies. So let's do that real quick. It probably makes more sense to see it. So we just did the second malloc call. And if you look at it now, we the size field, we moved it down 0x30 bytes. We subtracted 0x30 bytes from it. And we now have the two chunks on the heap nicely colored for us. Well, why are we having so big chunks? Like, what's the reason for having these blue and purple chunks? Sorry, can you? What's the reason for these blue and purple chunks, and why are they? Like, like, why they're colored like this? Yeah. Just to make it easier to read. So why is there so many zeros for the chunk? Because all of them are currently just zeroed out. We just allocated space. We haven't written anything to it yet. Oh. So you said this memory now belongs to us, <laughs> but we haven't like used it yet. That's like where the this code comes in when we start like filling out the memory that we requested. What's the yellow one? Can you yellow the yellow one? This? Yeah. Uh, it's just, in this case, it's not used for anything, I believe. Um, pretty much the way this is generally structured is that the size field is in this field, like the, at an 8 byte offset, pretty much. So every single chunk will have this kind of alignment. So I think this might just be padding in this case. I don't think it's ever actually used. I might be wrong, but I don't think it is. So are those are two allocations, the blue and then the purple? Yes, the blue is the first allocation, the purple is the second allocation, and then the green here is the top chunk size field. So if we execute the top chunk command that we saw earlier, this is going to give us a pointer to this top chunk size field, or I guess it's going to give us a pointer to here, but that's how some of the pointers in libc are managed, where it doesn't point to it directly, but rather at like uh, the 16 byte aligned version of it and the size that it's given, so it's an easier way to look it up. <clears throat> Any other questions on this? How does it know like what is, like which chunk is which? Like how does it know that there's a boundary between them? It doesn't. Okay, <clears throat> he's coloring it depending on like the... Which this is just something, <clears throat> sorry, uh, give me a second. <clears throat> This, <clears throat> okay, this is unfortunate. Uh, this is coloring is something that the debugger just adds. libc itself does not have any knowledge of this. So this is for your C program to track pretty much. Okay. <clears throat> the only metadata that libc has about this at this point is where is the top chunk and these size fields. So, and you have the pointers to this in your C code. So in this case, book sub zero is initialized to this pointer or to this pointer here. So in your C code, your code knows the regions of this, libc doesn't. Okay. So the way memory management is done in C is very lax. So like if you mess up with this, libc has nothing to correct you because it doesn't know. So when you free something, so let's say you would pass this pointer to free to free it, free would not be able to tell if this is a valid heap chunk or not. So the only thing free knows is the pointer you give it and the size field in this case. <clears throat> yeah. Is it 31 instead of, or 0x31 instead of 0x30? Uh, there are some flags it uses. That's, I guess that's another part of the metadata. We'll talk more about them later. I don't want to bring them up yet. 
So is the metadata stored in the same <clears throat> um, chunk of memory as well? Yeah, it's in line with the data. So the first eight bytes here are used to store the size of this chunk, and then comes the chunk data, and then the next chunk starts with the next size field, and then the next chunk data. So when you write stuff into the allocation, it won't overwrite the flags. Depends. If you you ask for forty eight, you ask for the amount of bytes, and that's what you got. If you try writing more than that, you might just over like it, this is books of zero. If you try writing more than the uh, bytes it gave you that you asked for, you might end up overwriting the size field of the next chunk, and that's how epochs happen. We'll talk more about like the specifics of that later. But basically, the same as in stack, C does not control any of that. Basically, just lets you do whatever you want. <clears throat> any other questions here? Okay, then let's move on. The, code, the next thing we do in the code is we just initialize the data. So let's step through the first few, do like two string cops of two strings, set an ID. We actually visit again at this point. We can see that the first chunk we allocated has now been initialized with some data, a title, an author, and the 0x1af here is the ID we gave it. So far, so good? Is the ID at length? Is the chunk going from left to right or right to left? A little endian, but oh. yeah. So this would be the cool, and then this would be the end of the OE, I think. Okay, uh, let's go through the next one, does the exact same thing for the next chunk. Type this again, and now the next chunk also is initialized with data. Basically, same thing again. All right, any questions on this? All right, so let's look at the thing we do next in the code. We free both of those chunks. So this is where we're basically, the heap allocator does not know what's, so the free call, the only thing we're getting free is a pointer. That's not a lot to work with, but that's all it gets. So we call free with books of zero. Let's see what happens. We free it, type this again, and now we get an annotation here that says fast bins. So now let's briefly talk about the bins. So in the heap allocator, when you free something, uh, the way it keeps track of it is by putting them into a bunch of linked lists. These linked lists are organized by their sizes. So in this case, since the size of this chunk was 0x30, we place it in the fast bins uh, linked list of size 0x30. Um, so at this point, we can use the bins command. Which it represents this a little bit better. Uh, ignore all the other bins for now. Let's just look at the fast bins. So we had an an allocation of size 0x30, we freed it, so it was put into the linked list of the 0x30 size fast bin. And this then points to zero. So you can see the, it's basically linked list, and this is the forward pointer of it. The pointer is zero initialized, so it knows that there's only one entry in it. So then when malloc tries to do an allocation later, it might look at this list of bins and just take the first one out of it. Yeah. So. Why? So when I do this on my computer, I have to re-compile uh, the program. Uh, why would it be in key cache bins instead of fast bins? That is where I kind of uh, used a different libc for this for now, okay. where t cache don't exist yet. Right. So t cache were added in like 2017, 2016. Mm -hmm. For this demo, I chose not to include them. We will talk about them. Okay. Probably either at the end of today or on at the next lecture. So when multiple frees are made, you then get multiple pieces of memory on that list. Um, eventually, they're coagulated, right? Um, is that done during the program afterwards? Or... We'll talk about that as well later. I'm trying not like put too much at once, like go step by step. But yeah, we'll talk about that. It does. Um, so what would you expect to happen if we move on to the code and execute the next free of the next books now? And add another thing to the, 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 yep. the link. Yes. Exactly. So we're going to execute m, type this in bins. This is going to tell us they're both in fast bins now. And if you look at the bins, we can now see that the first pointer is at zero x, uh, is the chunk at 0x30. And if we look at that, it now has a pointer to this chunk. And this still has a zero pointer. And we now have a linked list. Any questions on this? So when you type bins and you have the OX30, uh, what does the OX30 represent? Like, is that a, is that the size of the? That is the, the size field because we. So if we did an allocation of 0x40 size, it would be in the 0x40 size bins. Okay. 
Same like Xerox 20 to Xerox 80. If you do larger things, it's going to go into different types of bins. So you have like one bin for each? For each size, size, yes. OK. That's why they all need to be on uh, boundaries of 16 bytes. OK. Yeah. And so the linked lists of the free areas of memory are always within the same bin. They don't traverse bins for reference like pointers? No. <laughs> so if you tell mal if you tell your allocator I want a, I, I, I want a malloc a size of zero x twenty, it's going to check something is in the zero x twenty bin. If there isn't, they are found some things it might do, but I don't want to. It might look into the bigger bins that are bigger than zero x twenty and see if it can maybe use one of those. Um, but, right, let, let's say you want to do one of zero x eighty. There's nothing in here. There are no smaller fast bins, and you can't do it out of the fast bins. There's basically an allocation order to this where it checks the fast bins first. If there's nothing in here, it's going to check the other types of bins. Um, but we'll talk about that later as well. There's a lot we kind of have to delay here until we get there. Oh, and they won't combine fast bins? Or like no, nice fast bins are not generally combined. There are certain exceptions where it happens, but we're not going to be talking about them. They are mentioned in the readings if you are curious about it, but we'll ignore them. All right. Any other questions about this demo program? At this point, we allocated two things, we fill them up, and we free them. One thing that you may note here is even though we just freed them, they're not zeroed out. Some of the data was overwritten with like this pointer and this null pointer, but some of the other data, like you can still see the not Bobby string here or the other Bobby string here. Like this, th these aren't overwritten. Can anyone think of like a bug that might occur by not having this data overwritten? You, if, if the data is not supposed to be otherwise accessible, someone can do some forensics on it and get it? Potentially, yes. Or even just if you, let's say you allocate some memory and store some secret password in it. And then when you're done, you free that memory. And then later in a completely different part of the program, you try to allocate memory, and now just recycles that memory and gives it back to you. And it wasn't zeroed out yet. So you might be able to just read sensitive data that you never should have been able to read. OK. Yeah. So malloc just uses whatever is there. It doesn't like only uh, C alloc will zero it out. Yes. So that C alloc, C alloc, does that kind of just get rid of a lot of exploits that we use malloc for? No, not really. Okay. This one specific thing where you can leak out memory that's still there, but other ones not. Is this region of uh, memory executable at all? No. no. At least not since NX was introduced. Before it probably was, now it's not. Mm. Okay, cool. Let's continue the demo. Done. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, so these commands probably make a little bit more sense now. I'm just going to repeat them real quick. This, this is going to be the most important command. You can visualize what's on the heap. Bins, you print out all the bins. You know, print out one of the specific bins at a time. VM map, you've used before, and top chunk, just print out where the top chunk is. This can also be used to print out the top chunk, but sometimes top chunk is a bit more reliable. All right, so here are some basic rules to using the heap. So when you're writing code, these are rules you have to follow. Otherwise, you're going to introduce vulnerabilities into your code. Some of them sound benign and like it looks like this, but then you have an application where it's running 20 threads and you're passing a pointer to like half of them, and then in one of the threads it's suddenly freed and the others don't know about it yet, and you have some weird bug. And that happens so often in every single piece of software. Be it browsers, be it kernels, being things that the best developers in the world are working on, it still happens. So first rule, do not read or write to a pointer after it's been freed. This leads to something we call a use after free vulnerability. Based on what we have been going over, can anyone think of something that might be going wrong if you free something, this gets placed in a list, in a linked list, and then you start overwriting it by using it after it's already been freed? I can see, like you said, right, that there might be some uh, confidential or secret. Yeah, so if you read it out, that's one thing. What if you write to it? Yep. You can overwrite the other points in the link list, but if they're also free memory, I'm not sure what concern that would cause. Very big concern, as we'll find out later. But yes, as you just said, you can overwrite some, You can overwrite where this the next pointer points to, and suddenly you can put some arbitrary memory into the free list. I guess maybe that's not exactly what you mentioned, what you, what you meant, but yeah. yeah, that's what I was kind of going for. Okay, the next point: do not use uninitialized heap space. Kind of like goes in with the use app, right, with the read after free. Um, if you allocate space on the heap, unless you're using calloc, do not assume that anything about it. It could be initialized from secret data. 
It could be all zeros, it could be all A's, it could be whatever. So if you're allocating space on the heap, make sure you write to it before you use it in any way. Um, do not read or write after the maximum size of an allocation or before the beginning of an allocation. Basically, heap overflows or heap underflows. Basically, same thing as stack overflows or stack underflows. And stack underflow is not really a term. But in heap, in heap expectation, it's a lot more relevant. So uh, with heap overflow, for example, or in heap underflow, both can be applied to this. If you have one chunk where you're going out of bounds, since the metadata of the chunks is inlined, you might be overwriting the size field. You might be overwriting the some pointer of a free chunk that's after your chunk. There's a lot of metadata you could be overwriting that's going to really mess with the heap allocator. Um, do not free a pointer more than once. So you saw earlier, if you free something, it's going to get placed in this linked list. And when you allocate something, it's going to be taken out of this linked list. So what happens if you free something twice? Well, it's just going to get placed in the linked list twice. So then let's say you try to malloc it. The first time you malloc, you're going to get that chunk back. But then it's still on the free list, and you have it. So now you can write to it. And by writing to it, you can then overwrite the FD pointer inside of the free list. And suddenly, you're pointing, having have a pointer to arbitrary memory again in your free list. And that's bad. Uh, so that would be a double free bug. And also do not free a pointer that did not originate from out. So as we said earlier, the only thing free gets is a pointer. And free cannot tell very well if this is a heap region, if this is a stack region, if this is a code region, whatever. The only thing that free, at least in older versions, checks is, is this a possible size field? Is this like in the range of size that are possible? If you're giving it 0x41 for one for one for one for one for one, this is not a valid size field way too big. But it's basically going to check, could this be a heap region? If it is, then it's going to do its free operations on it linked in the link into its free list or whatever. So you could give it a stack pointer, and suddenly you have a stack pointer inside of your free list. This is bad. OK. Any questions on this? OK. Some of these are probably going to become more clear why you absolutely cannot do them once you, like, we start talking about exploitation and how these can be abused if you do make those mistakes. Um, yeah. Well, if you free something and then malloc, will it always use that data you just freed before it? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Okay. If it's the same size in most heap allocators, that is likely, but it does not have to. It's often in its best interest because it's faster to reuse memory that was recently used due to caching and stuff, but it doesn't have to. Most heap allocators probably will, but you never know. And you should definitely not rely on that for your program all the logic. Okay, so let's, this is kind of what we described earlier. Let's just have it up on a big slide real quick. So this is how allocated heap chunks look. You have your user data, and you have your small metadata up top. So this is your size field plus three flag bits. Um, the internal malloc pointer is going to point to the beginning of this. The pointer returned to the user is going to point here. Even though it's the same chunk, they have different pointers. That's how it operates. Um, and so basically, this is a size field. This is our extended line, as we mentioned earlier. And then here are the three flags. Uh, flag three is called prev and use. It basically tells the allocator if the chunk before this is in use or if it's not in use. So if you think back about our earlier example, we had a chunk here, and then we had another chunk here. If we freed this chunk, but this chunk still existed, its prev and use flag would have to be cleared out. Now, that basically indicates if the chunk before it is in use or if it's freed. Then there's the is mmap flag. So when you mmap a region of memory, it does not, it still goes on something on a heap, but it's not managed through the heap allocator as malloc chunks would. Uh, so if a chunk is mmap, there are no linked lists for it or whatever. If you mmap a chunk, it gets this is mmap flag. And if the free allocator sees an area of memory that's mmap, it's just going to unmap it pretty much entirely as if it never existed. That's why mmaps are, in general, a lot less efficient than uh, using malloc. So kind of just use them if you have to, or if you have a very good reason to. And the other flag, uh, non-main arena. Uh, do you want to talk about Snell later? Uh, let's do it quickly now. Uh, so we talked about the, all these bins earlier, and all these are linked lists. But libc needs to like know where these pointers start. Like, uh, So you know. So like if it wants to check if there's a Xerox 20 size bit or a Xerox 20 linked list, it would need to know where to check for the first pointer. And that's where the arena comes in. 
The arena is basically an array in memory. I'll talk more about it later. Uh, that for it has a good bit of general metadata, uh, and it also has the beginning addresses of the uh, chunks, pretty much, or of the bins. So let's say this is the this pen apps is not right. Okay. Well, good enough. Let's see. Okay, I'll say th these are the fast bins. So let's say you have this at zero x twenty size, zero x thirty, zero x forty, and so on. So then libc internally is going to have a pointer to this region, so it knows where this is. And then all the different size fields that it's tracking have a dedicated slot here. So let's say you make an allocation of size 0x20. It would check if there's the first pointer of your linked list is in here. If it is, it knows that there is a linked list for size 0x20. If it's zeroed out, then there isn't. That's kind of how it internally manages those linked lists. And this is basically called an arena in this case. And every thread gets, in theory, should get its own arena. If you have 20 threads, all of which use the heap, eventually all these arenas take a lot of space, so eventually you might not get new arenas anymore. I think there's an upper size limit that might be 8 or 16. Um, but there's basically, it's going to try to give every thread its own arena until it can't anymore. So each thread then has access to its own fast bins, to its own other bins, so you don't need to share that much memory with other threads. But at some point, it's going to be too much and can't allocate more arenas, and then it's going to start sharing arenas between threads, and that's also a big slowdown. Okay, um, and the non-main arena flag, I kind of, that's here. Basically, it tells it if it's the arena of the main thread or some different threads. Basically, just a small optimization thing. Um, if it's in the main arena, it's just going to know exactly where it is. If it's not in the main arena, it's going to be a bit slower because then it needs to figure out which arena it belongs to. Basically, all that flag means. Uh, some stuff we talked about earlier. The min oh, I guess we haven't talked about this one yet. But the minimum chunk size you get is 32 bytes. So even if you only ask for four bytes of memory because you want to store an integer on the heap for some reason, you're going to get a 32-byte region. Mostly because when we talk, if you remember about when we talk about the uh, bins and metadata that's required once you free the region, it needs some space to store like a forward pointer. It might also be a doubly linked list for bins that aren't the fast bins, so it might need another pointer. So there's a certain minimum size it needs, and that is 32 bytes. Um, so even if you ask for less memory, that's what you're going to get. If you do an allocation of zero bytes, it's undefined behavior. Some allocators might give you the minimum size, others might give you a null pointer. It kind of just depends at that point. Uh, chunk sizes are increments of uh, 16 bytes. Allocations always 16 bytes aligned. And chunks are always in one of two states, either in use or they're free. OK, any questions on how these chunks look underneath when they're allocated? So we, uh, from the internal analog pointer to the size field, they said always going to be empty eight bytes. <clears throat> this belongs to the previous chunk. Oh. So you see, like this, the way it's like laid out. At least this is how the disk command is going to process. Right. So that's what I'm going to do down the sides. Okay. This region belongs to this chunk, and that's kind of like this of the previous chunk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at how these then look once they're free. Now it gets a bit more complicated, uh, and we have some more metadata. So first of all, we still have the size field. Uh, it also still has the flags, even though they're not listed here. Uh, then we talked about the fast bins. They then have this forward pointer. There are some other bins, like the small bins or the large bins, for example, that also have a back pointer, so it's now a doubly linked list for reasons that we'll go over probably in the next lecture. Uh, if you're dealing with large bins, there's also even more metadata. Um, but we are going to completely ignore them with this year because they're not relevant for, for projects. Uh, the reading does mention it, though, if you're curious, it's going to go over that part. Um, basically, when you free something, some of the user data is then going to be repurposed as metadata. So this is a space you previously had for your data, so you could write to it once you out. Now you don't, no longer own it, so the uh, allocator space is going to use it for its own metadata. It might overwrite some stuff, not, probably not everything, so it's actually a larger region of memory but it now has access to that memory to do whatever it wants with it. <clears throat> um, and there's also the prep size. This is basically used for consolidation purposes. 
and it basically describes the size of this chunk of the previous chunk before it if the previous chunk is free. So then the last eight bytes of a chunk also become available for metadata. Questions on this? <clears throat> All right, this kind of is what we like saw earlier in the this command, how these are basically structured in memory. Yeah? What's the difference between previous size and back next size? Uh, the back next size is in something entirely different. It's basically more like list pointers. For large bins, they do it in a different way. I don't want to talk about them this semester because I think it just confused people last year and we don't use them for projects. They're in the reading if you're curious, but we're going to ignore them. They're just on the slides. Yeah. So when we did the viz stuff, uh, at least mine has like four U's overwritten, um, <laughs> and then everything else is zeroed out. So where does this stuff actually get like put? Are we able to see like the size field and the FD pointer? This, all of these should. Um, what gets zeroed out is the pre size. Nothing gets zeroed out. Tech, the, it might get zeroed out. The FD pointer, I guess. Like the pointers could be zeroed out if it should point to null, basically. Otherwise, the point the pointers might be overwritten. Or like these regions might be overwritten with a different pointer. So the use might just be part of some pointer, not actually like ASCII use, but just like that's the address in this case. Um, yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Uh, so now we have our actual slide on arenas. So <clears throat> for we talk about yeah. Okay. So for multi-threaded applications, uh, arenas are basically used to give each thread a separate heap. As I mentioned earlier, this basically just stores the beginnings of all of these different lists that every thread has its own arena of optimally. Uh, so this basically lets each thread use their own heaps without needing lots. So if you had two threads and both of those tried to use the same linked lists and whatever to determine if they can free or malloc or whatever, this would then require some form of locking mechanism, some form of concurrency management, and that's a massive slowdown. So as much as possible, you want to give each of the threads their own heap. Uh, SBRK, we haven't talked about it yet, but that is the syscall that is used to ask the kernel for another big chunk of heap space. I'll showcase it later. Um, but yeah, so these arenas cannot use SBRK to grow their heaps. Uh, right, the other arenas that aren't the main arenas can't use the syscall. The SBRK syscall operates solely on the main arena. Uh, so every heap you allocate in a thread, if it wants more memory, it's going to have to do a more expensive mmap plus mprotect uh, series of syscalls to basically allocate a region of memory for themselves. <clears throat> That's why like heaps and threads are always going to be a bit less performant, but this is probably not a massive feel in most cases. And the flag we talked about earlier, the not non-main arena flag, uh, chunks that are not in the main arena have that flag set for them. <clears throat> Any questions on this? So I thought threads could share a heap. Like if you create an object in the main thread and spawn other threads, they can still access that object. Yes. This is more in the allocator internal, it's not internal to your program. Okay. So all of the heaps are going to share the same memory space, so if you type the map, they're going to be next to each other potentially. So they still exist in the same memory area. But if you ask malloc to give you a chunk, it's going to use a different set of like free lists and stuff like that to give you your memory. Okay. So you can always pass a pointer from one thread to another and have it operate on it, but if you then free it, if one thread frees it, it's going to go into its own allocator basically. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, but, okay, I'm going to quickly mention the Tcache at this point then. Uh, so, in about 2016, so this didn't used to be that important because multi threading is somewhat new that it's being used so heavily as it is today. So, that's why Tcache weren't introduced until 2016, 2017, somewhere in that range. So what the tcache does basically another set of links uh, of lists that are accessed before the fast bins or any of the other li lists, and these are basically thread local. So for the tcache lists, instead of having this arena structure that this big arena structure that has to be shared, whenever you first allocate a heap, like the very first time your program allocates a heap, or for every thread that allocates a heap, in this first heap allocation region, an initial region is taken out of it that is used for the tcache, <clears throat> and this region then is basically used as 
basically a pseudo arena to keep to hold like these pointers to free regions of memory. So this basically lets every thread have at least this tcache region that it can use to service allocations without going into the arenas if you might be sharing arenas with other threads. Basically an optimization technique to uh, the tcache covers like sizes 0x20 to 0x410. And I think each one of these linked lists can be of size around 7 to 8. So your first seven or eight allocations of each size or freeze of each size are going to go into the tcache. And you never need to check the arena that might be shared with other threads because the tcache is always going to be thread local. But then when you do more, then it goes into the arena. So these massive supercomputers that have, are running maybe 512 threads at a time, they can now all, they might only have like around 20 arenas between them or whatever the max amount is. But each thread has its own tcache. And most allocations are going to be small and fast. And most allocations are going to hit this tcache and thus not need concurrency checking. <coughs> Quick summary of the tcache. We disabled it for this for the first few examples, but it is going to come up in one of your projects, and we'll talk about it more in the future as well. Questions on the we haven't like covered it too in depth here, so but over like we there will be a heap of uploads I believe where you will play around with the arena. There's no way we can play around with the tcache, the pseudo arena. Yeah, you can. Because oh. the tcache is on the heap. And if this is the heap layout, right under the tcache, you're now going to have your chunks being allocated, and here's the top chunk. So this is just how the heap layout then changes. That at the very beginning, you have this tcache, and then your allocations happen. So if you have a heap underflow where you write below the heap, you can suddenly overwrite pointers in the tcache. And the arena is completely separate. It's not, it's not uh, close to the. Yeah, the arena is uh, somewhere in the libc memory space. So if you leak a pointer from libc, as we've been doing to, for example, find the system function, you can also find the arena. Okay. So the arena is somewhere in, in libc memory, and this is in your heap memory. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I type in this computer, it gives me like a lot of zeros. So is that yeah, the that is the tcache. Oh, okay. Exactly. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. Let's talk about the different free lists that exist. So basically, as mentioned earlier, the heap manager tracks free chunks in these different lists called bins. And when you do an allocation request, it's basically going to retrieve a chunk from one of these bins, if possible. So there are a couple different lists. First of all, the tcache, as mentioned earlier. When you try allocating, the first thing it checks is the tcache. It has 64 different bins of size 0x20 to 0x410. And all of these are basically just linked lists again. Then there's the fast bins. Those are from size 0x20 to 0x80. Then there's the unsorted bin. I'm not going to talk about that one today. Same with the small bins and large bins. Those basically just small bins, 0x20 to 0x3 FO in sizes, and large bin, everything from 0x400 to 0x80 thousand. That's kind of why the large bin has like those extra pointers, because the large bin is actually not maintained in sizes of 0x10 increments, because it just goes too large. So there's like some other stuff going into that, but we're not going to care about it in this course. Um, yeah. Um, let's do a demo. <clears throat> so we have two more demos prepared. I think I'm probably just going to go through both of them here. Uh, any questions on this first of all, I guess, before we go through the demos? All right. So this is the first code we're going to be looking at. <clears throat> uh, the main function, it has an array of pointers. Each of these pointers basically just, we're going to mount a lot of memory. We're going to loop through 26 times. And each time, we're going to mount 5,000 bytes. <clears throat> we're going to do that one more time. And then we're going to allocate a massive region of memory. So <clears throat> let's look at why we're doing this. Uh, let's start it. Let's just skip this entire loop. And now we just allocated 26 regions of memory of 5,000 bytes. If you were to type this at this point, it will probably be loading for like 10 seconds, print out a bunch of bytes, and never actually get to the top chunk because you just allocated that much memory. This is, when you're dealing with that much memory with those big allocations, the this command starts getting less important, less useful, because there's too much memory that you don't want to manually inspect everything. So in this case, what we can do, however, is execute the top chunk command. And what we see here is that the top chunk, where we initially get got, prob got 0x2, the yeah, map again. Initially on our allocation, we got 0x21000 bytes, but we just did a bunch of allocations. So now our top chunk size is not very big anymore. 
So now if we do another allocation of 5,000 bytes, the top chunk can no longer service this. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the program now. We're going to do another allocation of 5,000 bytes. What would you expect to happen at this point? What, what just happened when we executed this? Either the stack. The stack has to get bigger somehow, so it's either going to make a new region or grow the region. The heap, but yes, you said so stack. Heap, yeah. 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 yeah, that's correct. So if we execute the map now, we can see that the heap region that was previously at size 0x21000 is now size 0x42000, basically doubled in size. And if we now execute the top trunk command, we can see that we have plenty of size left again. So basically, it just gave it another heap, re another region right below it, that kind of top trunk pointer of it. And there we go. Now, let's look at the program again. Next thing that's going to happen is we're going to mount this massive amount of memory. This is more than the current size of the top trunk, and that's like what we just got back. What should happen at this point? We could do that, but this is much bigger than another allocation with service as well. So what we do in this case is we see that the size is too big to efficiently handle by just keeping by just growing the heap the entire time. So we're just going to unmap it. So if an allocation is too big to efficiently handle by the heap alloc by the default allocator, we're just going to unmap instead. So we can execute it here, go in, and. If you look at the MF now, the heap region was not grown, but if we do info locals, we can, or what's the array called? Pointer. So if we print pointer of, let's print pointer of zero first. So this would be one of the arrays that was allocated using malloc. So this is what on the heap region, if we execute the MF, we would see that the pointer that we just printed out above it that just disappeared is in this yellow heap region. But if we instead print out pointer of 27, that's the one that we set to the uh, very large allocation, you can see it's a completely different region of memory. The heap was at 0x5 something, this is at 0x7 ff something. So if we look more closely at what region it is, it's 7e9b000, and that is this region of memory. So this region of memory, it didn't exist before, we just allocated it to service this MF allocation. Does that make sense? So you'll only grow your heap once from 21,000 to 42,000? No. So if we kept making more smaller allocations, it would keep growing the heap. But since we made one very large allocation, like this would have required us to grow the heap like four times just to handle this one allocation. We don't want to do that. Like that's more, It's more efficient to, in this case, just call mmap. And once we try to free that, it has the it's mmap flag set, so we just unmap it. Okay. So we don't even like deal with lists in this case. Basically, anything that is above the maximum size of the large bins, we just mmap instead. Yep. How would you know where to free that then? Because your C program still has a pointer to it. Ah. So you got to manage it on your own, just like everything else in C. So, yeah. When it gets mmapped, where is that allocation coming from? The kernel just finds some memory. Yeah, mmap is another syscall, just like the SBRK one. So you basically go in the kernel, and the kernel just gives you some memory back. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you like malloc another chunk that's bigger than what you have left in the heap, you have to allocate like you have to get more memory for the heap. Well, like when you start writing the data, will it end like where you left off in the heap, or would it start like in the new chunk? Uh, so your question was if you allocated some memory and then wrote, wrote to it, where would you be writing to? Or yeah, like if you like like in the last one when you like had to like get more memory for the heap, like would it start writing, like like if you were to write to it, would it start writing data like at the end? Pretty much where we did our allocation. So when we were like, we were extending the chunks. So before we did this mass allocation, we we're still like dealing with just growing the heap normally. In this case, we would just grow the top chunk down again by like that we would, the kernel would give us a lot of extra memory. Our top chunk would just go down a little bit again to service this one allocation, and the top chunk now has a size that tells us all of this is free again. So you're basically giving it a pointer like somewhere here, wherever it is, and you can, if you write to it, it's going to be there. Uh, so now, quickly, so on that demo, let's take a look at how this looks from the operating system's perspective. 
uh, are you all familiar? Are you, who's familiar with the S trace command? So this is basically the one you just run a program with S trace, and it's going to print out all the syscalls that the program did. So first of all, let's S trace the malloc program we executed earlier. Uh, it does a lot of syscalls to load it. Uh, we're only going to look at the very last ones here because these happened during our program execution. These were all like from the uh, ELF loader that handled a bunch of initialization. We're going to completely ignore them. So this is the ones we care about. First, BRK with zero nulls called. This basically tells it that we want to heap. And then we call BRK with some pointer. And this basically starts the uh, allocates the heap for us. So we're basically calling it to the kernel twice in this case and telling it, yeah, give us a heap, give us some heap memory. And that's basically how the malloc routines are started. And then we just call exit. Now, if we do the same on the chunks program, like the malloc program, if you remember, this one behaved properly. It didn't, it never grew the heap where you needed to call another syscall to grow it. It never I needed M maps. It just allocated its one heap region, used it, and then exited. If we use it on chunks instead, if we look at the end here, first of all, we have the same two BRK calls to initialize the heap. And what we do next is another BRK call when we start growing the heap. So we call it to the kernel and basically ask it for more memory. And then when we did this massive allocation here, we call mmap instead. And then we exit again. So this makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> why does it do two BRK calls to create the heap? I'm actually not sure. But okay. You could probably look into kernel internals as to why, but not not super relevant for us, but I'm sure there is a good reason, or not. It might just be backwards compatibility. Who knows? But yeah. Any other questions? All right. Uh, let's look at the other demo then. In this case, fastbins.c. So this program is once again compiled without the tcache. So we can like demonstrate the fastbins a bit. So here we allocate for uh, memory regions of size 16. As we know, the minimum gives us going to be 0 to 20 bytes, so 16 doesn't really, I mean, it's still going to be minimum of 32 bytes, but we're trying to get 16, I guess. Then we free all of them, and then we allocate four, and then we do four more allocations. What would you expect to happen in this program? No, first, I think it's going to be four malocs, it will want to create four of those um, chunks. And then when you keep on freeing them, it would add into the free, free linked list. And then when you call malloc again, it would just start popping off from the free linked list. Yeah. Uh, for the future, raise your hand. Someone else was putting hand there. Uh, OK, so let's look at the fast bits here. Next, we start again at the beginning of main. Then we go into this loop, allocate some chunks. Yeah, finish the heap or the loop. If we look at this now, we can see that we now have four chunks of size 0x20. One, two, three, four. So all these were just allocated for us in this loop. Then we continue going, and now go through the free loop. So we finish this loop, we free all of them. Now if we look at it again, zoom out a little bit. Uh, I hope this is still readable, but now it tells me that all of these are now in the fast bins. We can execute the fast bin command to see those as well. And we can see that all these were placed in the fast bin of size 0x20. So the pointer of the 0x20 pointer in the arena was now initialized to a pointer to point to the first thing in this linked list, and then the first one points to the next one, and so on. So the arena has a pointer to this, and this has a pointer to this, this has a pointer to this, and this has a pointer to this, and then this has a pointer to zero, indicating that the fast bin is that the list is now full or done. So basically what we would have expected at this point. And then when we start doing the allocations. We can now type this again, and we see that one of our memory regions was just repurposed from this list of pointers, and now has been out given back to the user. And if you look at the data that's still in here, you can see that the pointer that was stored in here for the linked list metadata was never overwritten. So if the user was going to try to just dereference what's there, they could get an, a heap leak, for example, in this case. They would just get an internal heap metadata pointer. So as I said, like if you get memory back, never assume that it's initialized in some certain way if you do it using malloc. Might have some data there. OK, let's do that again. And happened again. We just gave back, we just recycled another chunk. Let's do it one more time. Same thing again. OK, let's talk about something interesting now. What if 
Let's, let's talk from an exploitation perspective. What if let's say you have a use after free bug that would let you overwrite this chunk even though it's free? So it's currently inside of the spin linked list. It points to zero, points nowhere now, but it now has uh, the pointer there. What what could we do here? Corrupt the fast bin, fast bin list. Yep, exactly. So what if we just put a different pointer here? It doesn't even have metadata to tell us how many entries are in the bins list. So if you just put a pointer there that isn't null, it's going to assume, oh, there's another entry. So then the list is going to be expanded. So let's try that. Um, I think I should. The GDB commands for this is a bit annoying at times, so let me see if I can just copy paste from my slides. Yep. Now let's edit this. This points to C000. Okay. I think this should be correct. Let's try that again. Let's try that out. Yes, that was correct. So in this case, we basically just use GAB to manually overwrite uh, this pointer. And then if you had some sort of bug, you might be able to do it during the bug. In this case, we're just going to simulate having a bug that would let you overwrite this. So if we now look at the fast bins, we can see that there's still this one entry, and this entry then points somewhere else. So in this case, what happens if we do, let's do some more allocations. So let's do ni. Now if we look at the bins, we see that this arbitrary 0x for 1 for 1 for 1 is now uh, the next region in the fast bin. So if at this point, you were to do another malloc, it would try to give you whatever region is at this point in memory it would give to your program. That's not good. This is obviously not a valid memory region, so trying to use it in your program, you would instantly get a sec fault. But you can, you can write an arbitrary address there. So you could, for example, give it an address of a GOT entry, and suddenly you're trying to you're using malloc innocently, and you suddenly, instead of getting a random heap memory back, you're getting memory back that overlaps the GOT, and suddenly you can overwrite pointers in there. And suddenly, if you call puts, instead you're calling system. That's how bad stuff can happen there. We're going to talk about ways to exploit this and, and more interesting things to overwrite that basically instantly give you a shell. Um, but yeah, that's basically how heap allocation looks. You exploit some part of the allocator that lets you do stuff like that. Any questions? So the vulnerability in this case is that you can get back arbitrary regions of memory, and if that memory has some useful data in it, you can just overwrite it. And that can cause serious issues. Yeah. Um, can you do a similar thing with the tcache, or no? Yeah. We just choose to go with fast bins for now because they're a little bit simpler. Dcash has some more complexities that I don't, didn't want to start with now. Any other questions? Okay. So based on my slides, it looks like I went a bit ahead with the demos and did them a bit too early, but it's fine. Um, so let's talk about the simplified chunk allocation strategy. So basically, when you try to allocate something, there's a certain pattern it follows, where right? it tries first to try, it's going to try the most efficient way to do something. If that is not possible, it's going to go, keep going down in efficiency. So let's go through the list. So first, it's going to check the bins. If there is a big enough allocation inside of one of the bins, it's going to take it out of that. There's also a priority order there. It's going to check Gcash before, before fast bins, before uh, small bins, and stuff like that. There's an order there as well. But in general, if there's and the free memory region in the bins for your, that your size can use, then you're going to take that because it's faster. It's already there. You don't need to do anything. You just get back. You just get back a pointer. That's pretty fast. If there are no free chunks in any of the bins that you can use, and then you're going to allocate memory from the top chunk. So that's what we've been seeing a lot, where we do four allocate, we do a few allocations at the start of our program. Let's say you do a zero x twenty size allocation, it's going to give you zero x twenty bytes here, and the top chunk size is going to go down here, and it's going to be decrypted by zero x twenty. So basically, if you don't have bins, use the top chunk. So yeah. Um, what if the top chunk does not have enough space? Uh, that's when you invoke the kernel. You use the BRK or SBRK syscall. I think it's going to depend on your Linux version. In my case, it was BRK. And you basically ask the kernel to grow the heap region. If the heap has reached the maximum possible size, then you need to, uh, I guess we, OK, we haven't talked about this at all yet. Um, 
was on one of the was that actually VM map here? So here's the heap region. And here's the next region of memory. This is a very big space. These are millions of bytes in between. But maybe you have some application that's been running for three years, has a memory leak, and suddenly you have enough heap allocated to start overlapping with this. In theory, it's possible. 99.99% of applications out there are probably never going to be using that much heap space. But it's possible. You could be using gigabytes of heap space. Who knows? And if that happens, then you can no longer just grow the heap downwards because you would be overlapping with other regions. So in that, that case, MMAP is invoked to basically allocate you an entirely new region of memory uh, that you can then start growing instead. Um, this doesn't usually happen, but it's possible. And if everything fa fails, you just return turn all. It probably means that the system does not have enough memory available at this point to service your malloc request or whatever. It's just going to get null back. And as mentioned earlier, there's an exception for very large allocations where you just immediately MMAP it instead of bothering with the heap allocator internals. Questions on this? Can you unmap a memory region? Does it zero it out or just leave it? Nope, just leave it. Okay. You just basically remove the pointer from internal data structures that might be tra tracking it. How does it decide to put the initial heap back in memory? Which, at which point in which memory does it put? The kernel just decides it. There's like, it's going to place it at, usually, at least on mm -hmm. Linux, Windows does entirely differently. But Linux is generally going to place your heap after your program code data word where your pro so like program code is loaded at some address and the heap's allocated afterwards and then the libraries come and then like the stack comes. That's usually the order on Linux, I believe. Does that change to its like by neighbor? No. But with ASL right the ordering, no, this general order. But the base offset but the base address of the heap, like where the heap first starts, it's gonna be randomized by ASLR. Similar like the stack or the libraries. Does S break or break zero out memory? No, nope, it just gives you back memory. So this might actually have memory from a different process in it. Okay. Anything else? All right. So the simplified freeing strategy: uh, if the is mmap flag is set, just immediately unmap it. No list to worry about here. If it's in the tcache range, linked into the appropriate tcache bin. If it's in fast bin range, in the appropriate fast bin range. Uh, this is where it then starts attempts to consolidate chunks. So basically, if it sees that there are a couple of chunks in the heap that are next to each other, this is free and this is free, and these are both of size jerks 20, it might say, okay, I'm both free, let's put them together, and this is now one chunk, free chunk size zero x 40. The same applies if the, if the top chunk would be right under it. It might just merge them all into the top chunk, and now the top chunk size fills back up here. Uh, there's the console, this consolidation is not done very frequently, only on certain conditions. Um, there's going to be a later slide that explains when exactly, um, but this is going to suffice for now. Sometimes it happens at this point in the strategy. And if none of these worked, or if these three didn't work, then you try to consolidate, and then you put it into the unsorted bin. Um, I don't think I want to explain that sort of thing yet today. That's yeah, we'll do it next time, next uh, next week. Questions on this? Yeah. What are the common exploits with this? We'll leave that for next week as well. But basically, the stuff you mentioned earlier, like you have an overflow, you have a double free, you have a use after free. All these bugs can be exploited in different ways. Heap is interesting from an exploitation perspective. Where with ROP, you have a fairly linear technique where you craft your chain and just like execute some gadgets and it's going to do something. With heap, that is a lot less so the case. The two techniques we're going to be covering here today, these are still pretty linear. You have a certain bug that gives you a certain condition, and based on that, you follow a series of steps that are going to spawn your shell or whatever, you want, or, or whatever your goal is. When you get into more advanced heap exploitation, a lot of it is Manipulating memory in a way where you can get your heap laid out in a specific way that allows you to do a very specific thing. This is something that's that's going to be out of scope for this class. I tried teaching an early, like a fairly simple exploit in that realm, but it failed hard. Uh, we didn't have project on it anyways. We kind of just like tried going through the theory of it in class, but I think it's beyond the scope of this. Um, yeah, pretty much that. Heap exploitation can get very interesting, but also very hard, because there are a lot of mitigations that have been introduced over the past years. And yeah, at this point, there are over 30 mitigations. It's kind of insane. 
at some point you might just write a safe allocator, but now just pile out mitigations on top. All of which can be bypassed one way or another and just make exploit that tough lives harder, but not impossible. Other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, let's make this the last slide we go over then, I think, for today. Um, so this is uh, another picture, or right, basically another representation of the arena that we talked about earlier, like this thing, where at the beginning it has the pointers for the fast bins, so the starts with the link of the linked list. Uh, then it has a pointer to the top chunk, so it knows where the top chunk is. Then it has uh, last remainder fields. I'm not going to talk about this one at all. Uh, then it has an unsorted. Then it has the two pointers to the unsorted bin list. Uh, it's only two fields in this case, in the small bins and the large bins. That's basically the arena layout. It has a little bit of metadata and a bunch of pointers to the start of, the, of these linked lists. Questions up? Yeah. Where is the arena stored in memory? Somewhere in libc memory. OK, libc. So when your program gets initialized, you call the start function, and the start function calls libc start main. And one of the initialization routines that libc start main calls is going to initialize this arena. Actually, it might just be one about because first call that does that. Actually, that's probably when it's done, not at, yeah. Okay, what I just said is probably wrong. Probably when you call MALC for the first time, it's going to check if it's already been initialized. If it's not, then it's going to initialize that region in its memory space. That's probably how it's done, I would imagine. Yeah. What happens if you have so many threads, or like let's say Tcash isn't there, you have so many threads that they're all sharing and then they all run out of space still? Then all of your allocation are just going to return null. And your program either handles it or tries to do reference and null pointer and crashes. Any other questions on this? Or on the midterm, I guess, at this point. Or on your presentations, anything. We have like five minutes left, but I don't think I'm going to go any further with this. So any questions about the class? Now is the time. Yes? Was the midterm coming out tonight? Or? Yes, at 6 PM, and you have 72 hours. All right. If that's all, then we're done.